And that means you people actually might like each other, so that's a good thing, you know? Um, we are uh, so excited that you're here for worship this morning. It's good to see some, uh, some faces I haven't seen in a while, and i um, glad to know that folks are, are doing well and some new faces that have been joining us. It is a great time to worship um, in our house this morning. I am Pastor Richard Smith, uh, pastor of families and students here at Harrisburg United Methodist Church, and I welcome all of you. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we especially and warmly welcome you. I'm glad that you are here with us this morning. If uh, you get an opportunity in the pew, or I can give Usher get you one, a little green card that would give us some information about who you are, email, that kind of good thing, so that we can be in communication with you about things happening here at our church. And also, if you're online, we warmly, warmly welcome you also, and just let us know that you're present by, uh, by posting in the chat there. And if you need to uh, send us a message, please do that, and we will... Uh, we will return uh, those messages too. On the back side is a prayer request. If you have a prayer request need, please feel free to fill us out, put it in the offering plate. And it does go to our prayer team on Monday morning when we get a chance to look at these. And, um, and it is a, a very good way of communicating um, with us uh, as the church. So this morning you'll notice uh, a prayer shawl on the altar. It is for Marissa. And can you tell me a little more detail? Okay, so she's a coworker and friend of Sue Heffron's daughter who's going through a lot right now. I remember reading um, that this morning. So just a, a, a mom that is overwhelmed with things going on. So please, uh, during our, our hymns this morning, feel free to come up and place your hands on that prayer shawl and say some prayers for Marissa, please. With that, I invite you to um, take a couple deep breaths, Clear your mind of the things that have come this week and the things you've experienced and ask God to speak to you and to tell you in a voice that you can understand what you need to hear this morning. Some of you may need encouragement. Some of you may need strength. Some of you may need employment. Um, some of you may just be like, God, just get me through this week because there's a lot going on. Whatever it is that you need, open yourself to God's presence and listen for him and his voice this morning as we come together for worship. I invite you to stand for our call to worship as you are able. <coughs> Praise the Lord, maker of all, skies, seas, pebbles, and puddles alike. Praise to the God of big and of small. Praise the Lord, the Redeemer of all, powerful and pretentious, homeless and hidden alike. Praise to the God of big and of small. Praise the Lord, the sustainer of all, continents and cosmos, minnows and mosquitoes alike. Praise to the God of big and of small. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. I invite you to remain standing as we sing our first hymn, O Love, How Deep, number 267.
Will you pray with me? Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for the offering we are about to receive. May you bless it and multiply it so that we would be hands and feet in this community. We pray that you would anoint our offering, that it would smell sweet to you because we, we are giving from our hearts, Lord, and from the generosity you have poured out upon us. We thank you so much for allowing us to participate with you, Lord, in the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
scripture reading comes from John 15, 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in, remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit apart from me. You can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious Lord, we give you praise and thanks for this beautiful morning. We give you thanks for gathering us together as one body, as we listen and learn and we open ourselves to your presence, Lord. We pray your spirit upon us, Lord, that you would touch us and fill those needs in our hearts, but also at the same time motivate us and help us to be creative in how we look and how we reach out to the world around us. So God, this morning, as we think about meekness and all its meaning, Lord, may you Help us to understand that part of that is just relying simply on you for all that we are and all that we, that we need. God, we thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives. There are so many of us who are facing some that what may seem unsurmountable odds, Lord. But even in those, in those most challenging of times, Lord, we know that you are with us, God. We know that your presence will help us and walk with us through those days. And Lord, even in the good times, so many times we don't pause long enough to see you or to hear you or to notice that you are a part of the laughter and the celebration as well. Make us more sensitive to who you are and what you're doing in our lives and in the world around us. That, may we, that we may be motivated to do those things that you're calling us to do. To be the change and to be the light that you need us to be in this place. God, we thank you for what you're doing in all of our world around us. Continue to help us to make good decisions as we pray for our general conference that is still uh, that is still going on this week. We pray that you be with our leadership as they continue to, to struggle and wrestle with the issues before them. And maybe when we come out, we would be even more motivated to share your love and your grace with all of those around us, Lord. We pray for those folks in our congregation specifically and in our minds, our hearts, our friends and neighbors who need you in special ways, Lord. We know all of those needs, but Lord, we lift them up now in our minds and our hearts to you. Lord, we also pray that you would continue to help us to grow and help us to be people who care and love the world around us because of your love for us. And Lord, we pray for unity, that we would be made in one spirit and one mind and one heart, especially as we join in our prayer and your prayer together this morning saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. As we stand for our next hymn, I invite our children ages three through first grade to go with Miss Carol Lee to Children's Church. And I invite the rest of you to stand for our hymn 402, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian.
grace and peace to each and every one of you from God the Father through Jesus Christ our Lord another day's journey that the Lord has provided for us to assemble in this place at this appointed time and I don't know about you but I'm glad about it because somebody got the call to meet with him and we are still here in the land of the living to praise him in spirit and in truth well, so listen to your prayers as we continue with the Beatitudes in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. And we deal with verse 5 today. If you'll stand, please, just one verse of scripture, those who are able, as we look at this scripture for today. Blessed are the meek, for they shall possess the land. You may be seated. Will you pray with me, please? I need thee, Lord, I need thee. Every hour, your servant need thee. So bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. Now, Lord, the word is yours. The spirit is yours and we are yours. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Suppose the company that you worked for was creating a job description for a new CEO. I wonder if in that description would be something we're looking for a meek person. Or maybe even uh, during this presidential election, if that person is running for as a candidate, I could garnish the votes you need, but I am a meek person. And imagine if the SPRC called the cabinet and said, I want you to send me a meek person. But meek does not line up with power and grace that we are so accustomed to or seek for. Meek is a word that sometimes can be very misunderstanding. But I've learned through the years in ministry and I'm so blessed to have my father of the ministry, the Reverend Retoy Gaston, who has already joined his savior. And he would remind me to remain meek. He was the epitome of an example of what it means to be meek. Reverend Gaston, the one who used to teach me, he said, um, the last thing you put on when you put that robe on is your cross. And the first thing you take off when you finish is the cross. <coughs> He was a man who was in the Seabersville community. It was not a very nice area back in the early 70s. And I was wondering, well, how could my pastor sit there on the steps at dark, at night? And, but everybody knew him in the community. I shared with the morning service this morning. There was a, during that time, they had some ladies who used to walk the street. And he was no candidate, but he knew all of them. But he knew him by name, and regardless of that, it's just a meekness about him that I always <coughs> cherish. Not to get so arrogant. Not to get caught up with my education and the training and experience. I share with anyone, I tell them, say, I have three degrees, and none of them worth nothing compared to the wisdom that this woman gave me who just finished an eighth grade education. That's my mother. It can never value. We always thrive on those who are smart and those who are outgoing and powerful. And it's okay. But I do believe Jesus was pointing out to his disciples when he called them to the Mount, the, 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 the Sermon on the Mount, he was mentioning to them. Meekness is important for leadership, but also as a Christian. We don't want to be a meek person, we don't want a meek person as a leader. We want somebody who's charismatic and dynamic and just to preach in the coma, not here. I'm talking about those other places. So Jesus' third beatitude here. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Comes as somewhat of a surprise. What's so great about being meek? And why do the meek inherit the earth? That's the thesis of this text. But we have to understand that part of our problem is due to a misunderstanding of what it means to be meek. 
We hear the word meek, and we automatically think weak. We couldn't be no more wrong than what we assume when it comes to the word meek. Therefore, what does meekness require? Meekness requires, first of all, it requires strength that only God can give. And from a God-controlled person, you must be meek. God cannot use you if, if you're so full of yourselves, and that's a young folks saying a bag of chips. One way to define meekness is strength under control. We get a sense from this in the way it's translated. Elsewhere in our New Testament, but I love in the Amplified Bible that gives a solid understanding. Blessed, spiritual, prosperous, with like joy and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation regardless of our outward condition. So no matter what is going on around us, there's something on the inside that God gives us and we remain meek that he has a tendency to give us what we stand in need of. But secondly, meekness means the mild, the patient, long-suffering. And it also represents Psalms 37. The meek shall inherit the earth, and inherit delight yourself in the Lord for the abundance of peace. But in verse 29, it also says, consistently dwell within upon God's meekness. So what are we saying here today? The stereotype of meekness is a person who has no will of his own. We think of meek person as someone pathologically passive who cannot help others by taking advantage of him. That's how we look at meekness. Or well, meekness isn't weakness. A meek person is stronger than a warrior, but yet still because it takes more strength, listen to me, to control your temper than it does to storm off on someone. We are reminded meekness isn't passivity either. It's not sitting on the sideline, every action, allowing people to beat up on you or say anything. No, that's not meekness. It's power under control, especially for the Christian. The meek person is intentional and in control. So what does meekness look like in the real world? Specifically, what does meekness look like in the church? Paul gives us an example here in Ephesians 4, 1 and 2. He reminds us, he said, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Pay, be patient, bearing with one another love. And in blood terms, he's trying to tell us meekness means that you and I put up with each other regardless. It means that we will endure one another. I appreciate the Bible's honesty when it comes off this holy writ. But one thing we can imagine, sometimes we give the impression that the life in the church is a utopia situation. No problems. The Dairy, King, the Dairy Queen theme, eat, drink, and be merry. Everybody's on one accord. We think the church is a utopia, but it has all us here. We think, sometimes get the idea that real Christians never annoy, get annoyed with one another. Well, I know it's tight, but it's right. Christians never become frustrated with each other. Never get red, fed up with one another. Not the church. But yeah, I'm about to tell you, yes, it is. There are times we can disagree. But it also, I have realized in my years of pastoring that there are times when you ask the question, Lord, why me? And I have learned over my years that everybody is not going to be pleased with what you're doing. That's with everything we do. So meekness is an attribute of strength. It's not something to look upon as somebody being weak. To exercise, we must go against the grain sometimes. But the meekness doesn't merely take strength. It, I, if I'm going to bear one another with love, it takes a lot of strength. 
Have you tried to love somebody who don't want to be loved? Oh, God. You have to need to have the best interest at heart. So what else does meekness do? Meekness requires humility because you have to be a teachable person in order to understand what you're trying to do. It's a humility. Oh, I've seen some that have a whole lot of humility, but on the other side, they're arrogant as I don't know what. Have you ever run to that person who think they know everything? Y'all haven't been gone very far then because they, they're around. <laughs> but you got to love them anyhow. But you do it with a humble spirit. The words that Jesus is talking here, especially over in Matthew 11, 28, and 30, is this. Our Lord said, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest for your soul. Take up your yoke and follow me. What do you mean by take up his yoke? In other words, you ever seen an oxen? An oxen can't move by themselves. If one is going one way, the other going. That's why they are yoked up in order to go in the same direction. And when God is saying, yoke up with me, for I am gentle, I am humble in heart, and I will give you rest for your soul. How can we go through this world without somebody encouraging us, showing some humility? Show on so that we understand what being meekness and humble is about. If you haven't gotten about now, you know what humility is? It's pride, of course. It's the antithesis of humility. When we have so much pride that it doesn't make any difference. Each time we show pride, we put more strength in ourselves. Pride gives us a false view of ourselves. Sometimes we think that we are up here and everybody else is down here. Not you all. I'm talking to most people who might be listening this morning. I don't know. <laughs> Pride gives us a false view of ourselves. Pride blinds us and so that we fall to see ourselves glaring faults at everyone. Did the gospel tell us? Well, it's so good to see the splendor in my brother and sister eye. But what about the board in my own eye? Humility is the antithesis of pride. Worse yet, pride prompts us to put on a mask of humility. That we may fool someone that I got it all together. We love the mask. We're self-absorbing. We love for people to think that we're okay and then we're all torn up on the inside. But yet, just a little bit of humble pie brings us back to where God wants us to be. I used to tell people, I said, God is like a bronco buster. And we are the horse. If he can't break you, he can't use you. Because you're so busy wanting to do your thing. The teachable person is humble. The teachable person is trusting. What else is meekness? Meekness requires acceptance. The person in the fellowship of God. We cannot do this alone. God is the creator of all things. Did he not say the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all that dwell therein belongs to him, Psalms 24. So everything he created us for his purpose and his plan, and then he gave us dominion over everything else. So we require his acceptance. We require to be to meet with his situation. And it's when we come to a holy God who knows us better than ourselves. So to be meek is to yield to God, to give way to God. I know you all are smart. We all are getting smarter than we think we are. But I do believe if you do an inventory, God is smarter. And so therefore, you're not going to win that battle of his word and his cooperation to get us where he needs us to be. But it takes humility and it takes meekness. The Christian inherits this when they give their life to God. 
I'd like to tell somebody this morning, some battles are not yours, but the Lord's. There's some things you can't do nothing about. But when God steps in with your humility and he, he comes to me, all who are heavily laden, and leave it in his hands. You cannot make no one love you. I'm going to let that sit there a minute. You can't make nobody love you. That's something that only has to come through time and your way you respond in your meekness and the way you respond in your holiness. It's very important to hear this beatitude because after each beatitude, there's the promise. Jesus said, bless all the meek, Jesus said, for they will inherit the earth. Now you must understand, now he's not talking literally here. Those who first heard this were in a land that they didn't own. But yet still, Jesus was telling them to be meek and holy, to endure because it's in the hands of somebody else, but I'm still in control. So what is he talking about here? Bless all the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Jesus is saying the inherit the earth is wherever I reside. If he don't reside in your heart, in your mind, and in your soul, then I would do a checkup. He's not talking about this fallen world that we're in. He's talking about wherever he resides, that's it's where he needs to be. If you don't have it in your heart or your mind or your soul, <coughs> It's hard to do anything else. The day of the blessings is coming. All our heartaches, all our pains, all our mis being misunderstood. But he said, yeah, but where I reside, you don't have to fight back. Allow me, for the battle is not yours. I enjoyed this story so much as uh, Jay Kessler, he was I don't know if some of you remember Focus on the Family. Well, Focus on the Family was a very, I used to love Focus on the Family, but anyway, he told this story about this state trooper who's receiving a national award. And he came to the podium and the governor of that state asked him the most profound question. You mean to say you went 15 years of high state patrolling these cities, this um, highway, and you never beat up on nobody? <laughs> or forced them to put a force on them? Because they gave him a glowing description of why he received this award. And you know he told him? Now, I've really ridden with a lot of police officers in Mosul when I was a police chaplain. And I watched their demeanor. I watch how they operate. But he pointed out two good things here, Vance. He said, sir, there's two reasons why I did not do what you were saying. He's first of all, if I go and have to deal with a person who's intoxicated, I have to think, first of all, he's a man. The second of all, what would his wife think? Or his children? Or his job. He said, I can't just go just because the intoxication is there. I got to first look at him as a man. And the governor looked at him. He said, the second thing, governor, is the reason why I do that. When I approach a car, and I approach that car which is, uh, the, uh, to talk to that driver, he said, I tone my voice down because I don't want to escalate the situation. And we look at our world today. It's almost like self-preservation is the first law of nature. Well, I've ridden with some that were just uh, humble, doing their job. They have to deal with a lot of stuff out there. And I always pray every night. I have a grandson who just started driving, 17 years old. In Harrisburg, all I pray that he get home safe to live another day. His officer in his humility in a job that put his life on the line. But he said, I can either be part of the problem or I can be a solution. But through my meekness, I've learned I don't have to use that force unless it's necessary. 
I've learned to tone down a situation so we can come to some common understanding. And sometimes we get tired of each other, but I do believe if we show a little kindness and love, and when Jesus talked about the inheritance of the earth, we ain't going through this barren land, this old fallen world, but if we reside where we need him, in our hearts, our minds, our soul. That's what Jesus was talking about. He wasn't talking, because he said, this earth and heaven are going to pass away. All this will pass away. So it's wherever he resides. And that's the promise. No matter what you're going through, no matter how you've been mistreated, I don't care how much life is unfair, just remember, the meek shall inherit the earth. And if God's in it, I'm in it. And that's the kind of God we serve. The meek shall inherit the earth. Always be mindful that either you can make that scale go up or you can tone it down. Even with our meetings. I'm sorry. I never forget. We had come in a church meeting, several churches I pastored, and we disagree on some things. And what I would do to ease my pain and my conscience, I will ride down to the old College Street train station. And I watched the homeless just trying to make it through a day. And there's a bunch of people around the table arguing about a budget. And they're trying to just make it through the day. And once I sit there and watch them going back and forth across the street, then I can ride on back to my office feel good about it. Life is precious. Be careful how you live. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, let the church say amen. Amen. As we sing our closing song, where charity and love prevails. Maestro, please <laughs> say Gracious and holy God, we acknowledge you as the creator, the provider, 
and the control of all things. Teach us to learn from the lesson that you gave on the Sermon on the Mount. There's nothing wrong with being meek, but that's where we draw our strength from you. And I pray for God for a world that is a fallen world that we don't become so complacent. You promise us more than this. And we just want to be able to stand before you and give account of what you have get time that you've given to each and every one of us to touch every heart and soul that we come in contact with and tell them of your saving grace. Now may the love of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide in each and every one of us as we part from this place but never from your presence. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ our Lord, let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Thank you.